Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Duel of the Peaks. I'm your host Landon, and today I'm joined by Caleb. Hey guys. And for today's gameplay, we have brought to the table decks built around legendary creatures being reprinted in the Double Masters set. We're super excited to get our hands on these legendary creatures as they're being reprinted and the cost is going down, and we're super excited to test them out. Peter here to give some exciting channel news. First, we've made some big changes and have a new opportunity for you to support our channel. Click on the link in the top right to go to a special video presentation on our big announcement. Also, we're excited to announce some big changes happening with this channel's sponsor, GameGrid Lehigh. GameGrid has a new and improved website where it's never been easier to find the cards that you need to perfect your commander deck. And now, with the new site, GameGrid now ships nationwide, meaning you can get these sweet deals anywhere in the United States. Head on over to GameGrid Lehigh's website that we've included in the description of this video, and if you go through that link, you'll be supporting our channel as well. Thank you, GameGrid, once again for sponsoring this episode. We really appreciate it. One final thing, if you are missing on some of the details of what has happened in the previous seven games in this gameplay series, click on the link in the top right of your screen to go to a recap video that I put together for you to catch up on the points and the major events of the last season. Thank you. Back to you guys. So if you're unfamiliar with Duel of the Peaks, we have issued challenges to the table and challenges to the individual decks to kind of make the game a little bit more interesting and to open up lines of play that maybe wouldn't have happened before because people are trying to get points and I think it just adds a little bit of diversity to the game and we have a lot of fun with it. So for this game we have four table challenges and each deck will have its own personal challenge. So there will be three points if you win the game, three points if you cast your commander exactly once during the game, Two points if you draw the most cards in a single turn. And the last challenge is worth one point, and it is to reach 12 available mana, meaning that you can produce 12 mana in a turn from permanents you control. With that out of the way, let's get into the opening hands. Griffin is starting us off in turn order. He is playing Riku of Two Reflections. He kept a hand with Guided Passage, Magmatic Insight, Quasi Duplicate, Forest, Forest, Mountain, and Shivan Reef. And Griffin's personal challenge is to copy two creatures throughout the game and copy a spell three times in a turn. Next up, we have Caleb with Riss. Caleb's challenge is to create five different types of tokens. He kept a hand with Mirror Pool, Plains, Savannah, Austere Command, Paradise Druid, Skull Clamp, and Elvish Mystic. Next, Peter, playing Atraxa, kept a hand with Soren Markov, Oko, Thief of Crowns, Oath of Jace, Arcane Signet, Interplanar Beacon, Opal Palace and Arcane Sanctum. And Peter's personal challenge is to use the ultimate abilities of two Planeswalkers throughout the game. And finally we have Landon. He is playing Brea and he kept a hand with a Swamp, Watery Grave, Thought Vessel, Concealed Courtyard, Talisman of Dominance, Mystic Monastery, and Koldotha Forge Master. Landon's personal challenge is to have 10 artifact tokens on the battlefield. And a quick reminder, each of these personal challenges are worth two points each. Looks like we've got some pretty good hands to start off with. Griffin starting us off, he draws, plays down Shivan Reef as his land for turn, and he uses it paying one life to tap it for a red to cast Magmatic Insight, discarding a mountain and drawing two cards. He passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays Savannah as his land for turn and taps it to cast Elvish Mystic. Uh, not bragging or anything, but that Savannah is looking pretty hot on turn one. Oh yeah. Peter draws and plays down Arcane Sanctum, tapped as his land for turn, and passes the turn over to Landon. Landon draws and plays Mystic Monastery as his land for turn. It enters tapped, can't do anything else, and he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, 
plays down a mountain as his land for turn and with nothing else passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a plains as his land for turn. He then pays one mana to cast his commander, Riss the Redeemed. He then taps the rest of his mana to cast Paradise Druid, and feeling pretty confident with a bunch of mana dorks, he passes the turn to Peter. All right, Riss is a pretty awesome commander. He only costs one to cast, either a green or a white. And then he's got an ability to create a 1-1 elf warrior token. And then he's also got an ability for six and tap him. And then you put another token for each token you already control onto the battlefield. As you would expect from a commander like this, Caleb is looking to create a lot of tokens and overwhelm his opponents. All right, and then Caleb ships the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Interplanar Bacon as his land for turn and taps both of his lands for an arcane signet. Very nice. And with nothing else, passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down Concealed Courtyard as his land for turn. He then taps one mana to cast Soul Ring and then taps that Soul Ring to cast a Thought Vessel. He then taps the remainder of his untapped mana and casts Talisman of Dominance. That is a ridiculous amount of ramp. I or ramped four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On ramped. turn two. Yeah. I had one, two, three, four, five, six mana on turn two. That untapped. is crazy. That's nice. Very nice job, Landon. Thank you. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn. He then taps three mana for Guided Passage, the bane of our existence. <laughs> no. no <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> so, just really quickly, to explain Guided Passage, it's Griffin's favorite card in this deck, and his entire deck strategy kind of revolves around it, so he's super happy to see it this early in the game. Basically, it costs one blue, one red, and one green. It's a sorcery that says, reveal the cards in your library. An opponent chooses from among them a creature card, a land card, and a non-creature, non-land card. You put the chosen cards into your hand, then shuffle your library. And the reason why Griffin loves this card so much is because all of the creatures in his deck are absolutely nuts. There's pretty much nothing that Caleb can go get right now that's bad. Whatever he picks is going to be good, and Griffin is going to be happy to see it. So with Guided Passage resolving, Caleb chooses a Mountain, It That Betrays, and Sunbird's Invocation. All three of those cards go into Griffin's hand, and he passes the turn having to discard a card to hand size, which he discards Quasi-Duplicate. Caleb goes to his turn and untaps and draws, and plays down his land for turn. He then pays 5 mana to cast Orin Frostfang. That is a great card. Love that card. He then goes to Combat. Swinging wrists at Griffin. Griffin with no blockers goes down to 38 and Caleb gets a draw off of the Orin Frostfang trigger. With nothing else, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Dreadship Reef as his land for turn and taps three mana to cast Oko, Thief of Crowns. Oh he boy. This triggers his interplanar beacon, having seen him cast a Planeswalker and he gains a life. We have a little bit of a deal that is made at the table, so we'll cut to that audio real quick. If it doesn't turn any of my stuff into an elk, then I won't kill it next turn. I won't turn Orin Frostfang into an elk. Either. You're making a mistake, Peter! You don't swing it at me. Swing anything at me. It's a good deal. Um, for your next turn. Okay, you so... or Oko? Or both? Both. Okay, deal. Okay. Peter activates the Oko's plus two loyalty ability, making a food token, and with nothing else, Peter passes the turn to Landon. Thanks for not turning my super awesome snake into an elk, Peter. I'm welcome. Landon untaps and draws and plays down Choked Estuary as his land for turn, revealing a watery grave from his hand so that it enters untapped. He then taps four mana to cast his commander, Brea, Ethereum Shaper. She's a four colored commander. She costs one white, one blue, one black, and one red. She's a 4-4, and whenever she enters the battlefield, she creates two 1-1 blue Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying, so you know that she's already good. And then she's got abilities to abuse those artifacts and other artifacts in Landon's deck. She can pay two, sacrifice two artifacts, and then choose one. And you can choose between Brea deals three damage to target player, target creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn, 
and you gain five life. So basically all he has to do is sacrifice two artifacts to kill any of our commanders. So Brea is a super awesome and really flexible commander. And just note that if we don't already, we will have deck techs for every single one of these commanders. We've already got one out for Brea, so please go check it out as well as Atraxa and Riku. So Brea enters a battlefield with two 1-1 one -one Thopters and Landon takes a damage from the Talisman for tapping it for a color. And with nothing else, he passes the turn over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, plays down an island as his land for turn, and passes the turn to Caleb. Quick turn. Yeah. Caleb untaps and draws and immediately heads to combat and swings the Frostfang and his two mana dorks at Griffin, because he still doesn't have any blockers. Griffin takes five damage, going down to 33. Caleb draws three cards off of the Orin Frostfang triggers, and he is now winning. He is currently in the lead with the two-point challenge, having drawn four cards in one turn. He then taps three mana for a Dauntless Escort, and with nothing else, passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Opal Palace as his land for turn. He then activates Oko's ultimate Planeswalker ability no. to swap a food token for the Orin Frostfang. Best <laughs> trade deal in the history of trade deals. Oh. Maybe even ever. I should have seen this coming. <laughs> Orin Frostfang is probably the best target at the table. He then pays three mana to cast Narset, Parter of Veils, gaining another life off of the Interplanar Beacon. With nothing else, he passes the turn to Landon. I thought we were friends, Peter. Landon untaps and draws and shocks in a Watery Grave, going down to 37. He goes to combat and swings one lone Thopter at Oko, which is lethal. And Oko dies. Cue the trumpets. He's out of here. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Nerd. We're All not right. going to miss you, Oko. <laughs> he then pays five mana to cast Koldotha Forge Master. And then he taps two more mana to cast Chief Engineer. With nothing else, Landon passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as, a land for, as his land for turn. He then taps out to cast his commander, Riku of Two Reflections. So Riku came out in the original commander decks and we are super happy to see him being reprinted in Double Masters. He was expensive. He was really expensive. He is a perfect commander for this new set. He costs two, a blue, a red, and a green. He's a 2-2. Two -two. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may pay a blue and a red. If you do, copy that spell you may choose new targets for the copy and whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control you can pay a green and a blue if you do put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield so copies on copies that's basically what riku wants to do if you want to see exactly what the strategy is for griffin's deck definitely go check out that deck tech with nothing else griffin passes the turn to caleb caleb untaps and draws and plays on a planes as his land for turn he then pays 4 mana to cast Wiltleaf Liege. That enters the battlefield and is going to pump up all of his other creatures. He then goes to combat, swinging the Dauntless Escort at Peter for a total of 5 damage. Peter takes it, going down to 37. Caleb goes to his end step, and Peter taps his Dreadship Reef to add a counter on it so he can have the mana he needs to cast his commander on his turn. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn. He then activates Narset's minus two ability, looking at the top four cards of his library and reveals and puts to hand Liliana Dreadhorde General. He then taps out to cast Soren Markov. This wow, none of this is scary <laughs> at all. I know. We got the, we got the Dreadhorde General in the hand yeah. and Soren Markov on the field. Things are looking pretty grim. Yes. This will trigger his Interplanar Beacon, giving him a life, going up to 38. He then activates Soren's minus three ability, taking Griffin down to 10 life, and Soren will go down to one loyalty counter. Peter goes to combat, swinging his Orin Frostfang at Landon. Landon decides not to block and takes two damage, going down to 35. Peter draws a card off of the Frostfang and passes his turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and shocks in Godlish Shrine. He then goes to combat and, very afraid of the Sorin, swings a Thopter at Sorin, killing it. Thank goodness. Yes, sir. These Thopters have been doing work. Yeah, they Thopter are. Planeswalker Slayers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he then activates the Koldotha Forge Master, sacking, sacrificing itself and two other Thopters so that Landon can go and search his library for an artifact and put it into play. He finds and grabs a Thopter Assembly and puts it directly into play. This was kind of a misplay on my part. Um, sacrificing Koldotha Forge Master to itself prevented me from using its ability again in the future. So this was a pretty big play mistake on my part. Don't do that at home, kids. Yeah. Keep your Forge Masters. Keep them. <laughs> With nothing else, Landon passes the turn over to Griffin. 
Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn. He then taps out to cast Sunbird's Invocation. Terrifying enchantment. Yeah, seems pretty good. I wonder why Caleb put that into his hand. All right, Griffin goes to his end step. Caleb decides to activate Riss on Griffin's end step to make a green, white, 1-1 one, one elf warrior token. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and immediately heads to combat, swinging his elf warrior at Narset, the Dauntless Escort at Peter, the Wiltleaf Liege at Griffin. There are no blocks, meaning Narset dies, Peter goes down to 33, and Griffin goes down to 6. He then pays 1 mana to cast Skull Clamp, and he pays another one to attach it to Dauntless Escort. With nothing else, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and plays down a Forest, and he taps 5 mana to cast Atraxa using 1 colorless mana to, to activate the Opal Palace's ability, which makes Atraxa enter with a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Alright, Atraxa Praetor's Voice is another 4 colored commander. She costs 1 green, 1 white, 1 blue, and 1 black. She's a 4-4 four, four with a ton of abilities. She's got Flying, Vigilance, Death Touch, Lifelink, and at the beginning of your end step you Proliferate. So when you proliferate, you choose any number of permanents and or players with counters on them and give each of those another counter of a kind already there. So basically, Atraxa is one of the best possible commanders that you can have for a Super Friends deck because of that proliferate ability. Not to mention, she is an absolute monster of a creature by herself. This is a super good reprint coming out of Double Masters because she was really expensive. So yes, hopefully you all open one up. He then goes to combat, swinging the Orin Frost Fang at Caleb. And Caleb responds by making another elf warrior with Risk and throwing the elf in front of the Frost Fang. Does this kill the Frost Fang? It's a 2-5. Oh my gosh. Yup. And with nothing else, Peter goes to his end step and proliferates all of his things with Atraxa. There's no way I'm going to let Peter get more cards off of my snake. Landon untaps and At the beginning of Landon's turn, his Thopter Foundry will trigger because he has no Thopters other than Thopter Assembly. It will go back to his hand and he will make five Thopters. Draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn. He then taps two mana to cast Icker Wellspring. When it enters it, he will draw a card. He then taps one, and using his Engineer, he casts a Demir Signet. He then taps two more mana to activate Brea, sacrificing the Icker Wellspring and a Thopter. When the Icker Wellspring dies, Lennon will get another card. Such a good card. Yeah, it's really good. And he chooses to give Riss a minus four, minus four, which will kill Riss. He then taps four mana and casts a Thopter Spy Network. He follows up the Thopter Spy Network with tapping the rest of his mana for the Thopter Assembly. And with nothing else, passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn. He then taps out to cast Zendikar Resurgent. Wow. Nuts. Yeah, this is why we were afraid of this deck. <laughs> this is going to trigger his Sunbird's Invocation as he did cast Zendikar Resurgent for his hand. He gets to look at the top seven cards of his library and cast a spell that costs seven or less for free. He chooses to cast Genesis Ultimatum off the top with the Sunbird's Invocation trigger, and when that resolves, he gets to look at the top five cards of his library and put any number of permanents from them onto the battlefield and the rest go into his hand. He puts two lands into play and he gets three instants or sorceries into his hand. One of the lands that he puts into play is Temple of Mystery and he gets to scry the top card of his library and he chooses to keep it on top. He goes to his end step, discarding to hand size a Heroic Intervention and a Return of the Wild Speaker. Also in his end step, Caleb responds by casting Eladomri's Call, searching for an Elish Norn and putting it into his hand. Caleb untaps and draws and taps 7 mana for Elish Norn. This is going to kill all of Landon's Thopters and it's going to kill Riku. Caleb goes to combat and we have another deal at the table. We'll see if it's successful though. We'll go to that audio. Griffin. So here's the thing. Yeah. I'm at 6. Yes, you, you are. You can kill me anytime. Yes, I can. Right now sounds like a good plan. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can definitely cast your sauce next turn. Sometimes a man gets lost in the sauce though. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb swings the Wilt Leaf Liege at Griffin, the Dauntless Escort and some and an Elf Warrior at Landon for 12. Neither of them have any blocks. Griffin goes down to zero and Landon goes down to 21. Rip in peace, Griffin, you fought well. You know what's better? Than enchantment removal, Landon. Player removal. Player removal is pretty good. 
Oh, it seemed like a little bit early to lose Griffin, but when you got Soren Markov uh, knocking you down to 10 life, it yeah, makes it that was really easy to kill you. And with nothing else on his turn, he passes. And in his end step, Peter quickly adds a counter to the Dreadship Reef. Peter untaps and draws and pays one mana to cast Oath of Nyssa. When it enters the battlefield, he looks at the top three cards of his library and he puts a forest into his hand. He then plays the forest as his land for turn and taps six mana to cast Liliana Dreadhorde General, gaining him a life from the Interplanar Beacon. He activates Liliana's plus one ability to make a zombie, which will immediately die to Elish Norn. This triggers the Liliana, seeing a creature he controls die, and he draws a card. Pretty he good. Very good. Yeah, it's such a good card. He then goes to combat and swings Atraxa at Caleb. Caleb has no blocks, taking 6 damage, bringing him down to 34, and Peter will gain 6 life, going back up to 40. He then passes and proliferates at the end of his turn. Landon untaps, and in his upkeep, his Thopter Spy Network and his Thopter Assembly will trigger, but all of the Thopters are going to die as soon as they enter the battlefield, and the Thopter Assembly goes back to his hand. He then draws, and before he goes to combat, there is something that he wants to find out, so let's go to the audio at the table to find out what's going to affect his combat step. If I swing Brea at you, will you not block her? She'll let me draw a card. Yeah. And maybe see if I can get an answer to Spinach. Yeah. Elish Norn. Yeah. I don't know how I got Spinach out of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He swings Brea at Peter, and Peter declares no blockers and takes it, going down to 38, and Landon will draw a card off of the Thopter Spy Network. He then taps two mana to cast Sword of the Meek, and taps three more mana for a Tribute Mage, which dies when it enters, and he goes and finds a Wishclaw Talisman. He taps two to cast the Wishclaw Talisman, activates it, and with the Wishclaw Talisman's ability on the stack, he sacrifices both the Sword of the Meek and the Wishclaw Talisman to Brea, giving the Dauntless Escort minus four, minus four until the end of turn. He then resolves the Wishclaw Talisman Tutor and looks into his library for an answer for this Elish Norn. He then taps one mana to cast Dispatch, targeting the Elish Norn going to exile it. In response to this, Caleb sacrifices his Dauntless Escort to give all of his creatures indestructible until the end of turn. When the Dauntless Escort dies, Caleb's Skull Clamp will trigger, drawing him two cards. Landon then taps two mana to sacrifice Brea and Thought Vessel to activate Brea's ability, giving the Wiltleaf Liege minus four, minus four until the end of turn. The minus four, minus four reduction being given to a creature technically gets around indestructible because it's not an effect or an ability of a card in the game that's destroying the creature. It's actually a state based action when the creature's toughness is reduced to zero. So it's the game destroying the creature, not an ability from a card. So that was a lot of resources to completely get rid of all of the threats from Caleb's end of the board. But I think that it was probably worth it to get Elish Norn off of the battlefield because that was yeah. completely hosing Landon's strategy. Without his Thopters, there's not a lot that Brea can do. With nothing else, Landon passes the turn, and in response, Caleb taps one mana to cast Enlightened Tutor, searching for Aura Shards, and puts it on top of his library. Oof. That's called insurance, folks. Yeah. Caleb untaps and draws and pays two mana to cast Selfless Spirit. He then taps six mana to cast Austere Command, choosing to destroy all creatures with CMC 4 or greater and all artifacts. Peter responds to this with a counter spell, countering the Austere Command. Oh, man. Yes. That was a very, very important Austere Command. Yes, it was. With nothing else, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Exotic Orchard as his land for turn. He then taps 5 mana to cast the Planeswalker Johnny, Mentor of Heroes, gaining a life from the Interplanar Beacon. He activates Johnny's plus 1 ability, looking at the top 4 cards of his library, whiffing, not finding any targets for it, and they all go to the bottom. He then activates Liliana's plus 1 ability, making a 2-2 zombie, bringing Liliana up to 9 loyalty. He then goes to combat, swinging the Frostfang and attracts it at Caleb. Caleb has no blockers, takes 9 damage, going down to 25, and Peter gains 7 life, going up to 46. Peter draws 2 cards from the Frostfang trigger, and then he taps 3 mana to cast Oath of Jace, drawing 3 cards and discarding 2. At this point, Peter is winning with the most cards drawn in a single turn. He is at 6. Nice. He then goes to his end step, proliferating all of his Planeswalkers and all of his counters with Atraxa, and ships the turn to Landon. Landon untaps, and in his upkeep, Thopter Spy Network triggers and he gets a Thopter. He draws a card and plays Inventor's Fair as his land for turn. 
Landon now has 12 mana accessible to him and he gets a point for that. He cracks the inventor's fair immediately searching for a skull clamp and casts the skull clamp equipping it to a thopter. It dies and he draws two cards. He then casts Cart Clan Ironworks, equips the Skull Clamp to the Chief Engineer, and with nothing else, he passes the turn to Caleb. So at this point, Liliana's looking pretty scary. I don't know if you've ever read Liliana's ult before, Landon, but it is not pretty. Caleb untaps and draws, and taps one mana for Path to Exile targeting Atraxa. This resolves, and Atraxa goes back to the command zone, and Peter searches for a swamp and puts it into play. Caleb then taps 3 mana for Champion of Lampolt, and taps 3 more mana to cast Call the Coppercoats. He targets Peter with this, so he gets 2 human soldiers, which when they enter the battlefield, give Champion of Lampolt 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. He then goes to combat, swinging everything he can at Liliana, and because of the Champion of Lampolt, Peter can't block, and Liliana will go down to 5 loyalty counters. Champion of Lampolt is exactly what Caleb wants to see right now, because... The biggest problem and the biggest threat at the table right now are the big, huge planeswalkers and the fact that Peter can proliferate those loyalty tokens so easily with his commander, but he doesn't have a lot of big creatures, if any. So with the champion of Lamholt out, Caleb's going to be able to get a lot of creatures in. And with nothing else, Caleb passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps, and in his upkeep, he scries two with the oath of Jace having two planeswalkers, and he Such puts- Such a good card. Yeah, it is a really good card. The more planeswalkers you have, the better it gets. And he puts both cards on top with the scry ability. He then draws a card and taps five mana for Liliana Vess. He then activates Liliana's minus two ability to search his library for a card and puts it on top. He then activates a Johnny's plus one ability, getting Deep Glow Skate off the top of his library and putting it into his hand. That's some pretty good synergy right That's there. That's probably what he tutored for. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. He then taps five mana to cast the Deep Glow Skate. When it enters a battlefield, it is going to double the counters on everything Peter has. This now puts his Liliana Dreadhorn General into the ultimate zone, which he activates. Each opponent chooses a permanent of each permanent type they control and sacrifices the rest. Landon keeps his Thopter Spy Network, a Soul Ring, Exotic Orchard, and his Chief Engineer. Caleb keeps Champion of Lampolt, Skull Clamp, and Savannah. Peter gets two points for hitting his personal challenge of using the ultimate abilities of two Planeswalkers throughout the game. Yeah, so uh, both of our boards were reduced to nothing. Yeah. Sent this... back to the Stone Age. Peter is feeling so good right now. Peter is way far ahead. Landon and Caleb are, like Landon said, in the Stone Age. There's really not a lot that we could do at this point. And I think that in a regular game, most people would just scoop, but don't ever scoop because you never know when you can pull something out for the win. So stick around for the rest of the video because Brea has a ton of different ways that she can win out of nowhere and Riss might be able to help her out. Peter now goes to combat after sending both of his opponents back to the Stone Age. He swings the Orin Frostfang and a zombie at Landon. Landon takes it, going down to 17, and Peter draws two cards from the Frostfang. He then has to move to discard and puts Oath of Ajani into his graveyard. Landon untaps and in his upkeep gets a Thopter from the Thopter Spy Network and he draws. He plays down a mountain as his land for turn and taps two mana to cast Thopter Assembly. He then passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and puts the Skull Clamp on the Champion of Lampolt. He then goes to combat, swinging the Champion at Liliana Vess, and Liliana will go down to two loyalty counters. With nothing else, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and in his upkeep scries three with the Oath of Jace, putting one on top and the rest on bottom. He then draws the card that he put on top with the scry ability, and taps six mana for Deploy the Gatewatch. He gets Elspeth, Sun's Champion, Tamio, Field Researcher, off the top of his library and puts them both into play. Wow. Yeah. Really crazy. This, this is exactly where Super Friends decks want to be. They want to just have as many Planeswalkers on the field as possible because, obviously, the more Planeswalkers they have the harder it is to deal with them. He then activates Elspeth Sun Champion's plus one ability, putting three 1-1 one -one soldier tokens into play. He then activates the ultimate ability of his Ajani, gaining him 100 life. What? Yeah. How much? I just, they were like, we need an ability. Give him 100 life. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. All right. That's crazy. <laughs> Peter is at 147. The, yeah. 
Peter's at 147 life. That is definitely a new record on Duel of the Peaks. I would, yeah, I think so too. Correct us if uh, we're wrong in the comments. Yeah. He then activates Tamiyo Field Researcher's ability, choosing the Orin Frostfang and his zombie. So next time they deal combat damage, Peter will draw a card. He then goes to combat, swinging the Orin Frostfang and his zombie at Caleb for a total of 4 damage, bringing Caleb down to 21. Peter then draws 4 cards off of this from the Frostfang and Tamiyo's ability. He then pays 3 mana to cast Evolution Sage, which is really good in his deck, turning his lands into loyalty counters, basically. Yeah. He then passes the turn. He then has to discard some cards, discarding Umori and a Plains. Landon goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep, the Thopter Spite Network triggers, giving him another Thopter. And since he already has a couple other Thopters in play, the Thopter Assembly will not trigger. And then he goes to draw. He plays down an island as his land for turn, and then heads to combat. He swings the Thopter Assembly at Tamio and a Thopter at Peter. Peter takes one, and this will kill Tamio. Landon draws a card off of the Thopter Spite Network, seeing an artifact creature dealing combat damage, and with nothing else, Landon passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, and immediately goes to combat, swinging the Champion of Lampolt at Liliana Vess. This will kill Liliana Vess. And with nothing else, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, and in his upkeep, the Oath of Jace will trigger, and he scries three, putting all three on bottom. It must have been bad. Yeah. And he draws a card. He then taps 3 mana to cast Idyllic Tutor, going and finding Doubling Season, putting it into his hand. He then taps 5 mana and casts the Doubling Season. This is the nail in the coffin. <laughs> this is definitely the nail in the coffin. Doubling Season is such a good card in any Planeswalker deck because when the Planeswalkers come into the battlefield, they will have twice as many loyalty counters as they would mm -hmm. but when they activate their abilities they still get the same number because it's part of an activation cost yes important to note that he then plays down cross and verge as his land for turn this will trigger the evolution sage and it's going to double pro proliferate all of the counters on all of his things because of the doubling season he then activates a Johnny's plus one, looking at the top four cards of his library and not finding anything. He then activates Elspeth, making six soldiers because of the doubling season. He then activates Liliana's plus one ability, making two more zombies. And feeling like he's got enough tokens, he goes to combat and swings a zombie and the Frostfang at Caleb and three soldiers at Landon. None of them have any blockers. Caleb goes down to 17 and Landon goes down to 14. He then is going to draw five cards off of the Orin Frostfang. So good. That Orin Frostfang has stuck around this entire game. I think it would have been a much different game if you would have had it. Peter then goes to his end step having to discard Assassin's Trophy and three lands to hand size. Landon untaps and in his upkeep makes another Thopter with the Thopter Spy Network and draws for turn. He plays down Smoldering Marsh as his land for turn and immediately heads to combat. He swings the Chief Engineer at Caleb and swings all of his Thopters at Elspeth. Caleb goes down to 16 and Elspeth goes down to 1 loyalty. Landon then taps 2 mana to cast Trash for Treasure, sacrificing a Thopter and returns Wishclaw Talisman to the table. And he only has to pay 1 red mana to cast Blasphemous Act, dealing 13 damage to all the creatures. This will cause Peter to draw 15 cards from Liliana, seeing them all die, and Caleb is going to draw two cards off of his Champion of Lampolt dying. And with nothing else, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn, and then he pays two mana to cast Priest of Titania. Finally at two lands. Yeah. And some ramp. Woo 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 woo. And with nothing else, passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and in his upkeep scries three, keeping it one on top and the rest on bottom, and draws. He then taps seven mana for Eerie Ultimatum. <sighs> so Eerie Ultimatum is a super cool card that was printed in Ikoria. It's a massive sorcery that is a haymaker in Peter's deck, and especially at this point in time in the game. He returns any number of permanent cards with different names from his graveyard to the battlefield. Each planeswalker that comes back in is going to enter with double loyalty counters, and that deep glow skate that Landon so conveniently put back into the graveyard with the Blasphemous Act is going to enter again, doubling all of the counters on all of his things again. So that's going to end up putting six times as many loyalty counters on all of his planeswalkers as they would normally enter with. 
Whew, that is crazy. Basically, all of the Planeswalkers that are re-entering the battlefield are entering with enough loyalty to ultimate that turn. He starts off by using the ultimate ability of Tamiyo Field Researcher to draw three cards and getting an emblem that says he no longer has to pay mana costs of non-land cards in his hand. He then casts Ugin for free, which is going to enter with a whopping 14 counters. And then he plays Oath of Teferi, which is going to let him activate each of his Planeswalkers twice in one turn. He then plays Ignite the Beacon, searching for two more Planeswalkers, putting them into his hand. And he then activates Liliana Vess's minus two to search for another card and put it on top of his library. He then casts Narset Transcendent and activate Narset's plus one ability to get Chainville off the top of his library, which is what he tutored for. He then plays Jace Unraveler of Secrets for free, and then he activates Jace's minus two ability to return the Deep Close Gate back to his hand. He then plays Vraska Relic Seeker and then plays the Deep Close Gate so that Vraska has enough loyalty to use her ultimate ability twice. Vraska's minus ability sets an opponent's life total to one. So he sets my life total to one and Caleb's life total to one. He then activates Soren's plus two ability twice, draining me for two and Caleb for two, killing us both, giving Peter the win. Yeah, nice, dude. Good job, Peter. That was incredible. That was quite the turn. That was a super exciting game. Again, congratulations to Peter. That was a well-fought battle and he definitely deserved that win. For me, the play of the game was, uh, it's a really big split between the Soren Markov minus ability setting Griffin to 10 and that Liliana Dreadhorde general ultimate. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to go with the Liliana Dreadhorde because technically the Soren ability didn't end the game for Griffin. Yeah. It just set him to 10 and then... I was the one to actually deal the rest of the damage needed to get Griffin out of the game, which didn't have to happen. I don't think that the Planeswalker deck, the Super Friends deck could have pulled that off. That Liliana Dreadhorde though, that That's true. was incredible. Yeah. Uh, after the game, Peter was telling me that he felt kind of bad having to destroy basically all of our lands because that is kind of a feel bad, but if your group is okay with it, which ours is totally fine with it, then go for it. I think the feel bads kind of came for after our lands got destroyed, we had to play for another couple of turns, like not really being able to do anything. And as we said earlier in the video, if we weren't filming this game and it was just like some random game that we were playing, I think we both would have scooped as soon as that happened. For sure. Um, but when we're when we're recording gameplay videos and we're presenting them in a professional manner, we want to make sure that the victories are definitive and deterministic and that it for sure was Peter that was going to win. And that's just kind of the level of like content that we wanted to make. And I think we could have learned a lot from like the ending of the game on how to navigate like on super low resources and maybe we could have done a little better or like maybe there are some different paths that we could have taken. So I'm glad that we decided to play it out. But I, yeah, under normal circumstances, I think we went just scooped. It was definitely a super fun game. And the reason why Peter ulted Liliana Dreadhorde in the first place was to win. And that's and ultimately the point of the game. Can't He's, blame him for doing that. You cannot. And it was an awesome play. It is so cool to see so many Planeswalkers ulting and being able to activate their abilities twice. I, I absolutely love that Super Friends deck. Great yep. job, Peter. The MVP of the game, I'm going to have to give to Orin Frostfang. <laughs> Orin Frostfang was there the whole no, game. No, honestly, like, awesome. I, sh I should have kept track, but he drew so many cards throughout yeah. the game off of that Orin Frostfang. Too bad that Oko stole him right at the beginning. <laughs> or you could give the MVP to Oko. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. All right, now let's go over the point totals for the end of the game. We're going to tally all that up. Griffin got three points for casting his commander once, bringing him to 38 points total up until this point in the season. Landon gets three points for casting his commander, one point for having access to 12 mana from his permanence, and this brings Landon to 22 points. Caleb gets three points for casting his commander once, bringing him to a total of 21 points. I think that's the first time I've gotten those three points because I always recast you always, my commander. <laughs> yeah. Peter gets three points for winning the game, three points for casting his commander once, two points for hitting his personal challenge, two points for drawing the most cards in a turn, and one point for having 12 mana accessible for a grand total of 11 points. This brings Peter to 46 points. Wow. So Peter got every single point that he could have possibly gotten, which brings him to the lead. Congrats, Peter. 
Thank you guys so much for sticking with us to the end. We hope that you enjoyed this game as much as we did. We appreciate your guys' support. We couldn't do this without you. You guys are awesome. If you like our content and you want to see more Duel of the Peaks episodes, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We post one of these every month and we do deck techs for all of the commanders that we're playing and we release deck techs every Monday and sometimes even on Fridays. And just one more time, today is the official launch of our Patreon. We are so excited to bring you guys a ton of sweet things, merch, cards, extra content, etc. Go check it out. Uh, the link is in the description of the video. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.